you are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul. Let's get to the show. Well, hello, 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 my friends. You are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery. I am your host, Jesse Mogul. I am in addiction recovery. I am nine minutes away from my 47th birthday. Yes, once again, I am shooting this in the wee hours of the evening. It is 11.51 p.m. on a Wednesday night. It's June 14th. I am merely minutes away. My tribe's already sending me happy birthday. (laughs) Not necessarily my tribe, but our tribe is sending happy birthday messages on the thing. And this one with, uh, it is definitely a uh, teddy bear playing a guitar with butterflies all around and awesome, awesome lights behind it. That is... (laughs) It's joyful. I want to thank you so much for joining me once again on another amazing episode of From Sobriety to Recovery. I am going to bring you guys some um, little Jesse-ism wisdoms. Once I decided to shoot this show after a uh, coaching session with one of the members of the tribe, I decided rather than sit here for the next 30 minutes and make up show notes. I was just going to flip on the mic and go. And I have not done that very recently. Most of of these have had some level of research behind them. Um, (laughs) Pretty sure that's a B. Yep, that's a B. (laughs) The the memes on my birthday, uh, for my birthday on the thread are popping up and they're making me smile. Um, And I know she's going to be listening to this tomorrow. I know that I was literally watching her post these memes in the thread as I was doing the show. If you have ever wanted to have more support and more in-depth conversations about the things we talk about in this show, um, you know, the good grow greats, the, the, the desirables, the undesirables, all of the, the, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of the above, um, this is just an opportunity and a half for y'all to reach out to me. Go to um, jessemogul.com slash ask me. You can send out a form and fill it out and I will get out to you. We'll have you um, in a call with me and we'll get you over into the tribe because it is just one of the most amazingly supportive groups I could have ever have hoped in a million years to have been a part of, let alone have been the founder of and created. So if you are looking for people that are like you, who listen to the show, who are excited about their sobriety and recovery, and also understand that there are ebbs and flows in it and just would love to have some support, um, we have an opportunity right here and now and always. Just go to jessemogul.com slash ask me and uh, fill out the little form that I've made available and then you can have a call with me. Wouldn't you like a call with me? I would love to have a call with you. Okay, so that's three and a half minutes of Jesse just being goofy. Today, we are going to cover what from sobriety to recovery actually means. Now, there are so many layers to this. And if I were to go back and think about what created the idea behind this show, Um, I had a dear friend named Tina who had been a part of the NLP company that I had learned all of this neuro-linguistic programming from, and she helped me with my social media for a little bit back when I was super engaged in it, and we had this awesome meeting at this little, like, Greek restaurant slash coffee shop, just adorable little setting, and we met there, and it was super far away from my house in Los Angeles. Like, it was down in Orange County. It was not the easiest meeting to get to. L.A. traffic being what it is, it was like 30 miles away, but an hour and a half in time. And when I got there to have this meeting with her, it was to really hash out what the idea of this podcast and the energy I wanted to have around it was. And my therapist, Melissa, and I had talked a lot about the difference between sobriety and recovery. And at the time, there was a lot of debates happening on some Instagram profiles that I was following about people being dry drunks and judgments and all of these things happening. And I had this idea that we never really know what somebody's doing about their sobriety and recovery other than what they can articulate to us. And who are we to judge somebody else's path because it doesn't look like ours? 
if you know some things about statistics of addiction recovery, that generally, whether it be the 12 steps, whether it be any, any of the programs that are out there, even the addiction recovery centers, there's usually about a 20% success rate. Um, you can Google and the number might fluctuate 5 or 10% here or there. But if people in the industry are being honest, you're looking at about four, or f- four out of five who will not succeed the first time they step into the sobriety and recovery world. And because of that, I realized that there's a lot of room for empathy and a lot of room for us to create this space where we realize that there's going to be this teeter-tottering, that there's going to be this ebb and flow, this back and forth of this journey. You know, just like the ocean waves crescendo upon the beach and then pull back, there's going to be an excitement level we have towards our sobriety and recovery. And there's going to be days where it's just like, fuck, man, are you kidding me? I got to do this shit again. And when I sat down with Tina to have this conversation with her and I was bringing all of this energy in, I had five years ago previously in 2012 done this big motorcycle journey where I drove a motorcycle that I specifically bought because it was yellow and white. And then I outfitted it with all black saddlebags and everything else so that it would look like a big bumblebee driving down the road. And I called it Bumblebee. And I did 12,000 miles on this motorcycle in four months. And it was supposed to be this amazing documentary called Searching for Something. I was going to have it edited and the whole deal. You know, I was in Hollywood at the time. And instead of it turning into that, I did document it fairly okay, but I didn't journal and I didn't do my daily video entries into my journal. And I didn't do a lot of the things that I was going to do because I spent a majority of it in wildly intoxicated. Like I've crushed like a freaking, what was it, a liter? It was a lot. It was at least two fifths. Not important. What's in, what's insane is that I crushed like damn near an entire, you know, fifth more. Again, not important, Jesse. Focus. I got mad drunk driving from South Dakota to Indianapolis. You know, I tried doing the iron butt challenge. I wanted to do a thousand miles in a day, but the drive I needed to do was only about 700 miles. So I got 700 miles on the bike in one day. And I remember having pictures of me holding a cigarette and a fifth of vodka in my left hand while taking pictures with my GoPro with my right hand. So my hand's not even on the saddle, on the, on the handlebars driving through Iowa, (laughs) wildly intoxicated at like two in the afternoon. And I didn't even get to my destination till midnight. So I'm thinking of this as I sit down with Tina that we're all searching for something. And that's why I went on this documentary motorcycle trip. I was searching for something. I was searching for places to put my mom to rest. I was searching for answers to the, my meaning of life. I was searching for so many things. And ultimately, what I found on that trip was and more alcoholism. And I certainly did have these profound moments um, along the ride, but it never really lived up to what I wanted it to live up to. And in fact, I walked away from that trip with a lot of shame. And so as I'm sitting down with her in 2017, or you know, sorry, 2018, because I didn't launch the show till January 1st of 2019, um, as it was in 2018, as we're sitting down and we're thinking about this, I was like, you know, there's a lot of differences between sobriety and recovery. And it's like, I want to use this toward energy and I want it to be something where we discuss how there's really this amazing journey that takes us you know, into sobriety and then on into recovery. And we bounce multiple names around. And now looking back on it, it seems pretty obvious that the name of the show was always going to be from sobriety to recovery. But in that moment, we weren't so sure. And we're sitting here brainstorming names. And it was her who ultimately took many different variations of what I was saying. And she's like, so basically, you just want people to understand what the journey is like from sobriety into recovery. And I was like, yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just from sobriety to recovery. What's so hard about it? And we both just astounded that in that moment, what to us was the perfect name was finally articulated by us both. And what this show has always set out to do was to really in a very action oriented format, discuss what it's like to go from active addiction into sobriety, and then on into recovery, because we know it's a journey. 
and we know that it's going to take time. And when we try to rush things that need to have a certain pacing, that's often when we find ourselves stumbling, lapsing, or allowing our emotions to overtake us. You know, when we have this drive to go, 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 it's, it makes me think of, you know, the Sistine Chapel and Da Vinci. And, you know, it's like, hey, I mean, he may have only gotten two feet of the thing painted in a day, but it wasn't ever meant to be painted overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. An amazing life fully enraptured in what you do day in and day out and finding meaning and purpose and an aim and goals and achieving those things that anything worth doing is going to take time. It's going to take time. And as addicts, we often didn't want to t- take time. We didn't have a whole lot of patience. If I want cocaine at 1215, by God, I better have an answer for how I'm going to get it or it better already be in my nose at 1216. I don't have time. I have desire. I have lust. I have need. And when we step into sobriety and then start working our way into recovery, there are differences. And to judge somebody else's and say, well, you're a dry drunk because you don't go to meetings, or you're a dry drunk because you don't go to therapists, or you're a dry drunk because you don't do a pogo ball off your roof onto somebody else's roof and then into their pool, and you try to make these judgments about what somebody else is doing and whether that's actually going to work for them, we need look no further than the statistic I mentioned earlier that 80 people out of uh, you know, four out of five, 80 people out of 100 aren't going to succeed the first time. And if you're one of those that did, then I mean, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. For me, I must have tried 30 times, but none of them were as serious as my last time. I never had checked myself into a hospital. I never had gotten myself a therapist. So in many ways, I could say, well, I guess my most important time was my last time, and that was really the best time to do it. And so as we ask ourselves, what does a journey from sobriety to recovery mean for each and every one of us? That it is going to be individualized. And I'm not really sure I've given you any more in-depth answers into what from sobriety to recovery means for you now than I would have 12 minutes ago before I hit record. But alas, that's sort of my way is that it's important if you go back to uh, one uh, introduce a new member of the tribe and one of the things that we had mentioned today when we were going over the show was the one episode I did where I discussed are you being um, addiction version of yourself, sobriety version of yourself, or are you being recovery version of yourself? And how do you tell the difference between these two? And where is it that you're aiming yourself whenever you go to behave a certain way? Because in its episode 198, are you behaving like someone in addiction, sobriety, or recovery? When we think about all of the topics, whether it be emotionally grounded versus emotionally triggered, reaction versus response, automatic negative thoughts, forgiveness, love, cutting toxic people out of your lives. I mean, we're 216 freaking episodes into this, and I'm pretty sure I've got another thousand in me. We want to stop and say, okay, if you are new into sobriety and recovery, what can that look like for you? And also realizing that even if you're months or years into this, that this idea of sobering ourselves up can work for a lot of different things. We might be drunk on our phone. We might be drunk on automatic negative thoughts. We might be drunk on immediately getting emotionally triggered. And when we go to change any of these behaviors, the tens of tens of thousands of habits that could be built around this particular behavior, these um, automatic negative thoughts or these adverse childhood experiences that are fueling this behavior that we no longer desire to have within ourselves. We're really taking this journey from sobriety to recovery every time we decide we want to break a habit that's no longer serving us, our loved ones, or our environment and world at large. That we can say, well, yeah, the big ones are alcohol or meth or heroin or cocaine or kratom or whatever it might be, but there's going to be so many other areas in your life where what we discuss on this show are going to come into play. So if you're in active addiction, you know that basically means just 
tossing your entire life away if it means getting intoxicated and high. And once we've had enough of being sick and tired, then we start to snap into this idea of like, okay, there's got to be a different way. And we're all going to approach that and have our own variation of a rock bottom. Do you got to wake up in a shit tub? No, you do not. Do you got to wake up in a garbage can in an alley? No, you do not. Do you have to come to with track marks all over your arms in a flop house for the last six months? No, you do not. For some people, it can look very much cleaner. It could actually be the big house in the hills with the fancy cars and a regular job. But at some point, their body breaks down, their family units break down, their emotional centeredness breaks down. We all come to this place where enough is a fuck enough. And what I've really noticed recently with some people that I've been um, either coaching or just had around me through his way and some other places that I've been doing some work is that we can get ourselves overwhelmed thinking about all the things that we have to do or get to do, if you will, in our lives in order to create this fantasy land into a reality. And we can often have amazing dreams and amazing ideas. That It's, it's all a fantasy until we take action and we put ourselves out there and start trying to achieve it. And most recently... Um, a young person I have been coaching for a little bit, uh, more so because of his affiliation with an addiction center that I'm affiliated with, and less so than somebody in my natural life, is there's been this ebb and flow where it's like the future pacing of all the things that are ahead um, cause him to almost feel overwhelmed um, by that. And then he just takes many, many, many steps backwards. He lapses, he gets down and then he resobers up and gets back on his way. And it's what I encourage him to realize is that he's in the beginning stages of sobriety that yes, you know, he got himself through a nine month program and then got himself through another six month program. And he's had his little back and forth with this, but that really truly embracing it for him would be more of releasing the pressure he puts upon himself based off of what his family expects from him. That's his role with sobriety and then to move into recovery. Other people may not have any family at all pushing for them to do stuff. And so now the internal driver is on the inside. It's themselves. And are they being gentle enough on themselves? You know, addiction is just full-blown, go at it, don't care what kind of travesty we leave behind us. It is me, me, me. Um, In NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, I teach something called spiral dynamics within that. And there's um, the red, which is the third level. And it's got a much longer name, and I'm not going to get you guys lost in the sauce on that. But the red level is the third level, and it's very me-oriented. And all people who go through addiction uh, find themselves locked into the red, into the me-oriented version of themselves, where they're like rebel without a cause or a clue. And at some point, we get ourselves... um, If lucky, we shake ourselves enough that says, okay, let's try sobriety. And that moves us up into level four, which is the blue level, which is much more rule oriented, where we say, okay, doing it all on my own wasn't working. What kind of systems can I start to put in place that perhaps can give me that structure that allows me the opportunity to clear up my head long enough that my body can get itself back to some sense of equilibrium, that my emotions and my mental acuity can start to pull themselves out of the fog and out of the muting that's been happening. And we can actually start to progress forward in order to feel some level of achievement. A lot can be said about how hard humans push themselves and specifically how hard Western civilization or even um, Eastern Asian civilizations push themselves so hard. Accomplish, 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 accomplish. Good, bad, right, wrong. Let's not judge it as much as let's just realize that that's the habit loop our civilizations have gotten themselves into where we judge people based off of their job and their wealth and their earnings and their education and what they've achieved. Now, the beautiful thing is, is those of us in the sobriety and recovery world will often applaud those who've gone through the most heinous of hardships and come out of it. And regardless of whether they're financially stable or drive a fancy car or wear the newest clothes, the fact that they're sober and in recovery is enough to get everybody up on their feet. 
we have a different level of empathy. We experience other we experience other people's point of views and models of the world with it with this heavy hearted, beautiful, lightheartedness, right? Can it be both at the same time? It can. Heavy hearted because we know what it was like for that person to go through that shit. But also lighthearted because we see what they've been able to achieve and we can smile and we can applaud them. So when you ask yourself, is somebody going from sobriety into recovery? There is going to be that part that's going to want to be noticing changes. The emotional stability, the ability to share your deepest secrets, to be vulnerable with sometimes complete strangers, to start to notice your body and to get back into it, be working out or eating healthy and caring about these things. And I'll be the first one to admit, life did seem quite easier whenever I was just snorting and drinking my way to happiness. There was a lot less thought (laughs) about what I was going to do with each day. It was work, make money, are my bills covered, because heaven forbid I don't have a home to do my drugs in, and heaven forbid I don't have a car to drive to get my drugs. So I had some (laughs) foundational things that I had to have in my life. Other people did it differently, but for me, those were some important things. And now that I'm in sobriety and in recovery, and I can fluctuate, there are some days where I absolutely behave like I just got into sobriety, where I'm still not able to speak my voice without having it be aggressive, where I still mute myself, where I should speak up so I'm more passive-aggressive or just straight-up passive. I mean, there's definitely areas where we will consistently be working on A lot of it is going to be communication-oriented, getting people on the phone with us sometimes in order to even begin to make amends, let alone get the words out that will begin to reformate, reformate, (laughs) reformulate, sure, whichever one, dude, reformulate the friendship, right? In many cases, we dumped gasoline on a bridge, and once the bridge was on fire, we'd launch kerosene at it, and when it wasn't burning fast enough, we called up (laughs) the defensive, you know, council and said, can I get some missiles on this bridge? So giving somebody a call up and saying, hey, I'd really like to fix the things that I've wronged you about may not necessarily be greeted with the most open of arms, but it's just the ability to make that phone call and say, hey, this is something that's important to me. As I'm working on my sobriety and recovery, I would like to begin to figure out a way to introduce you back into my life if that's something that you're open to. And those can be tough conversations too. But it's in that humility where we step back and say, my ego doesn't need to be in charge anymore. It got me into this fuck storm. I'm ready to get out of it. Where can I have gratitude just to be thankful for my breaths, let alone that I'm not a quadriplegic? You know, today I had to go to a doctor because I've got some issues with my left foot. Um, and we started discussing some of the reasons why my skeleton might be damaged and why my ligaments and tendons and muscles might have some issues. And one of the questions that came up was uh, any major traumas. And I laughed about it and wanted to be like, well, uh, my mom got Crohn's at eight and my parents got divorced at 18. And I was like, oh, you mean bodily traumas? <laughs> I was like, because I got a whole list, brother, about emotional traumas. And uh, we started going over all my car accidents. And when I bounced my head off the pool at UF and when the ocean almost killed me during the pandemic. And he's like, wow, you've got like six major head traumas in your history. And I'm like, yeah. And every single one of them was the potential to put me in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And even in that moment of saying it, I got the shivers like, I know I'm blessed to be walking and talking and and having a full use of my body, regardless of the pain in my neck and back and shoulders and everything else. I'm blessed to even feel my body. And I have gratitude that drunk Jesse didn't put me in a wheelchair, but he did help me get a college degree and he did a lot of good for me. And yes, I'm not always thrilled with some of the quote unquote bad he did uh, with with this vessel, but at least we got ourselves to here I am at 47 years old, which passed 15 minutes ago. Talk about getting enraptured in the podcast. And so congratulations, I made it to 47. And 47 feels pretty freaking good. 47 feels pretty freaking good. It won't be like my 40th birthday where I blacked out at noon and got dumped by my girlfriend. Nope, won't be like my 40th birthday. <laughs> 
I'm not sure which was worse, waking up out of a blackout at like 11 p.m. and then opening up my phone and realizing that (laughs) I had called her in my blackout. And whatever I must have said elicited some pretty angry texts back at me, but definitely the number was blocked. There was no (laughs) more. communicating with that person. Um, so I'm not sure which was worse, waking up with uh, a massive hangover at 11 p.m. on my birthday or realizing I had been dumped <laughs> that I had gotten myself blocked. It was not a great day. Um, so back to the show. <laughs> Thank you for celebrating my 47th with me. No, but wait, There's no way I'd, I'd rather have turned 47 than on the microphone with y'all. So sobriety is counting days. It's white knuckling it. It's just hoping that you can make it through because you're not putting maximum effort into it. We already know. We already know 216 episodes in that this is a lot of fucking work or it's not work at all. And it's a blast. I mean, it could be whatever your subjective perspective is, but we know what it looks like when we see somebody who isn't putting in their time to heal their traumas. One of the reasons I stopped going to AA whenever I was at University of Florida is the people in there just seemed like all they did was complain about dumb shit in their lives. This one guy in particular, I went like four or five times um, over the course of this month to the same meeting. And this guy is over here complaining about his cat scratching him. Every week this dude complained about his cat scratching him. And I was like, really? Is this this is what he got sober for? Is this what I can look forward to? I get sober and I'm just going to complain about silly shit in my life? Now I have less judgment and, and I'm sure there was something he was trying to get across and he was just using his cat as his way of doing it. But at the time I was just like, this, is, this can't really be it. This can't be what sobriety is going to be like. Um, so I started going to the gym, which did substantially cut my drinking back for those two years as I managed to drag myself out of that university. And now I look back and I say, okay, if sobriety is white knuckling it, if it's counting the days, if it's not putting in the time, we're not journaling, we're not going to meetings, we're not getting a sponsor, we're not building a support system, we're not monitoring our body and drinking more water or hitting the gym once in a while, eating a little bit healthier, monitoring our emotional triggeredness, um, responding rather than reacting. You know, when it comes to mental, are we putting in good information? Are we still watching the same, you know, mind numbingly dumb shit that was dragging us down to begin with? You know, our spirituality, are we checking our morals, our ethics, our values, our principles, our beliefs, our opinions, our habits, and the standards of all of those things? You know, are we putting effort and attention into them? If we're not doing so many of those things, then yeah, we're not drinking, which is great. Great. We don't want to be using, but are we healing? And if somebody were to say to me, you know, give me one sentence for what the major difference of sobriety and recovery is, I would say it would be this sentence. How much am I putting toward the attention of the healing? How much am I putting toward the attention of the healing? How much am I putting toward the attention of the healing? I just totally pulled that out of my ass, but I was looking for something around attention toward healing. That would be my bumper sticker. Am I paying attention to my healing? Is my healing of the utmost importance to me each and every day? Because I have done nothing for 22 years but destroy this vessel, cr- you know, cripple up my mind and just try to jam it down into a garbage disposal to flip on the switch and just let it burn up the motor just to yank it out and try it again the next day. When we step ourselves into recovery, we literally look ourselves in the mirror and say, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better version of myself locked inside here somewhere. Where's the keys? I want to let him out. I want to get him out here in the sunshine and let's figure out a way to help him thrive. What is that way for you to thrive? We want to be putting our attention toward the healing because there was suffering and there was pain and there was sadness and there was shame and jealousy and envy and gluttony and lust and greed and all of the seven deadly sins and other sins I can't even think of right now that were involved in the addiction. And when we go to step ourselves into sobriety, right, we inadvertently make this agreement that we will leave no stone unturned. 
that nothing will just be like, oh, well, that's just how I've always done it. If I say that's just how I've always done it, oh, that's just how I was raised. Oh, that shit's getting pulled out. We are putting 15 spotlights up on that because I will not tolerate me simply saying, well, that's just how I was raised or that's how I've always done it. I'm not saying that just because that's how I've always done it or because that's how I was raised is necessarily not how I want to live my life now. I'm just saying we are absolutely going to microscope that shit. We're not just tossing it off to, oh, that's just family tradition. (laughs) No, 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 no. No. And in many cases, especially as we get older, we start noticing things about our parents and the people who are our primary caregivers and that are in our family, that are in our friendship circles. We start noticing things about them that we're not exactly thrilled about. And if you notice it a lot, it's probably because there's parts of that in you. right? Your perception of me is a direct reflection of you. I know you've seen that somewhere in a meme land on the internet. Your perception of me is a direct reflection of you. The the unconscious mind will make sure it points out things we don't like in other people, oftentimes so that we will notice it within ourselves and we'll get that cleared up. There's an incongruency. So in recovery, right, that's absolutely paying attention to those signals that our body's sending us, that our mind is sending us. This is why I've said when you feel a charge, take charge. When we get those signals, that's the mind and the body and the spirit saying, hey, 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 pay attention. This matters. If this isn't in you, then it's probably around you. And if it's no longer serving your highest need, we need to figure out a way to clean it up. It's time to clean these things up. When we live in a world where we just put on blinders, and try to ignore the world around us. We get so laser focused that we almost become selfish in the me, 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 me. We live in a society that's very me oriented right now. All right, now we get ourselves completely blinders off where we're seeing all the world around us and everybody else's feelings and opinions and thoughts and actions matter more than ours. Then we get into this people pleasing. Where now it's like, okay, how can I not upset the cart? I don't want to upset the tribe. don't want to get myself ostracized. We want to find this harmonious balance between the two. Where we know how to ebb and flow between, okay, I'm doing this for me versus I'm doing this for we versus I'm just straight up doing this for you. Because there are times where I do things that are specifically for other people. No, this is not how I would necessarily prefer to spend my time, but I know that it means a lot to you. This will super benefit you, and in a way, that also benefits me, and therefore, it benefits the we. And that there is this balance between them. So if you're asking yourself, are you in sobriety or are you just in recovery? Hold on, let me take that back. Are you in sobriety or are you also journeying into recovery? Then start to really take inventory. Are you working on your physical, your emotional, your mental, and your spiritual? Are you putting attention towards healing your sufferings and your pains and your adverse childhood experiences? Are you actually diving inward, going through your steps or your truths or whatever program you're in and whatever philosophy they're teaching you? Are you getting into that? And even if you don't, necessarily agree with every aspect of it? Are you walking into it with a growth mindset that tells you there's something amazing to be learned here? Let me take this information in and then let me start to organize it and see how it can benefit me. Not every program, not every episode I've ever had of this show have you absolutely agreed with what I've said. In fact, one of the members of the tribe and and also a, a client once said, he's like, I don't always agree with what you say. But that's the point. You don't need me to. It's like I still listen and I take things from every episode. I don't necessarily have to agree with everything you say. But I've opened my mind up to the fact that there's always something to learn. The fool and a wise man meet upon a path. Who learns more? The wise man, because the fool never listens. And when you step into whatever program, whatever world you're in, when sobriety becomes your thing, just take all of it in. You'll, you'll cherry pick at some points, you know, being mindful. I have a friend who always says, well, you just got to figure out what works for you. 
Well, my kickback on that is, well, what works for me, what has always worked for me, may be exactly what got me into this shit show to begin with. So I'm very mindful to catch myself when I say, no, no, that doesn't work for me. I want to do it this way. Well, is that just how I've always done it? Because if that's how I've always done it, it's time to shine a light on it. Uh, shine a light on me. Shine a light on you. Shine a light on we. Let's shine lights. Because when we take things from the shadow, they have no choice but to be seen differently. And that's what recovery brings us. Whenever I ask myself, am I in recovery? Am I speaking my voice in an assertive yet loving way? Am I speaking my truths? Am I noticing where I might be people-pleasing versus uh, being selfish? Do I understand what my self-care is? Am I creating a routine that's actually replicatable? I've got friends in my circle who have like a two-hour morning self-care routine. Now, that's great and all, but are you always going to have time for a two-hour morning self-care routine? Like, if so, then more power to you. But if something were to get in the way of that and that were to break down and the routine wasn't as structured, are you going to be able to maintain your sense of energy and self-reliance and your, you know, emotional stability if there are shifts because you have created this extremely long morning routine? Is there a way that we can shorten it up in case you don't have as much time? Is there a way that we can be flexible? I mean, look no further than my book. And yes, I am in the process of writing the Sobriety to Recovery book. And if all works out well, that comes out in 2024. Along with my app, um, I know I've got a lot of things on their books. But most importantly, I did write a book for the College Success Habits podcast, which will soon be taking a long, long, deep nap. And in that book, my seven powerful principles were develop a growth mindset, Cultivate courage, be decisive, take action, embrace discipline, exercise flexibility, and embody tenaciousness. And those would absolutely be the seven powerful principles that I led my life through in, I'd like to say throughout my addiction, but let's face it, that was that was an ebb and flow. But certainly when I got sober, that's what I stepped into. This idea of growth mindset and courage, decisive, taking action discipline, flexibility, and tenacity. These things matter to me. And whenever I am in my depths of my awesome recovery, it's when I'm embracing those seven powerful principles the most. I highly recommend you go buy the College Success Habits book. And everywhere I talk about college or use college-y kind of themes and words, just replace it with addiction or sobriety or recovery because it absolutely works. I mean, in a way, I was very much writing that book, trying to help college students not become future addicts. So I think that might be the end of this episode uh, because I could trail off and bring up a million and one sidebars. But I definitely think that uh, I want to get some sleep because we're going to, weather willing, um, the water park tomorrow. And we're going to splash around and enjoy the hell out of that before I have dinner with the family for the big 4-7. It is the 4-7. I'm super pumped. You know how I feel about the number seven. You know how important that number is to me. I have made such a big deal out of every episode that ends with seven. So to actually have my year of my birth right now be four seven, I'm really going to make this year count. Um, you know, yes, I've got the book I would like to get out, um, the, the app I've been working with and on for quite some time. Um, there's a might be a TEDx talk in my future too if I decide to put my energy toward that. So many things can happen and none of them would be happening and even be a possibility if it wasn't for sobriety and recovery. I first and foremost know that. We have to all agree that once that decision's been made, you have to protect your sobriety like a mama bear does a cub. It has to be the most important thing in your entire life. That at no point can you ever use the sentence, I do not care about my sobriety and recovery. All right? That is the end-all, be-all. Everything else is built upon the foundation of that. Does sobriety suck? It does not. Does life just suck sometimes? It can. It can also be a subjective perspective in that moment too. Because even on my worst day, sober was better than my best day intoxicated 
And I had some pretty fucking amazing intoxicated days. But every single one of them was followed by uh, just some of the most devastating hangovers you could possibly imagine. That the happiness was short-lived and the pain right behind it lasted so much longer. Now I get to have happiness and the next day I just get to be alive. When I saw Weezer the other day, and only in dreams still, I mean, I stopped letting myself listen to that song because it started feeling almost like, not monotonous, but it just stopped being as exciting. So I said, okay, that's it. I'm not listening to this song for a long time. I want to step away so that it can be fresh. I don't want to um, over relive that experience. But I knew in the moment that they hit that crescendo of only in dreams. That what I was experiencing that in that moment was one of the most powerful connections to music that I could desire to achieve. And there's generally, it's like every time I eat, there's that one perfect bite. There might be lots of amazing bites, but there's that one perfect bite where I get the bacon and the mayonnaise and the onion ring and the ketchup and the cheese and the onion and the pickle and everything just is all there on the palate at once. And I just, and I taste it all and I'll just look over at my girlfriend or whoever I'm eating with and be like, that was it. That was the perfect bite. Um, If I'm really blessed, there might be three or four of those (laughs) in one burger. Um, But even tonight, I was eating and I was like, that's it. That was the perfect bite. In every concert I go to, there is that one perfect bite. And for that Weezer show, it was like the ultimate of perfect bites. And not every day gets to be a Weezer show. Not every moment gets to be that. I'm listening to this Led Zeppelin song. And I think it's go, come, going to California. And he goes, uh, one of the lines in it is, how can tomorrow ever follow today? And because uh, I was sanding a wall the other day, so I decided to listen to all Led Zeppelin for three hours. And that line still gives me shivers. Like, how can tomorrow ever follow today? And with addiction, there was very little chance I was going to be able to relive those moments Um, and not still have to face the pain the next day. Whereas in sobriety, I get to have these amazing moments. And the next day, yeah, it's not going to be the crescendo of only in dreams at the Orion, but it's going to be amazing that I get to wake up and listen to that song and get to smile and feel the muscles get joy and drink a little coffee and start my day and do what I do and then hit the gym and then do more of what I do and then have some amazing food and then do more of what I do and relive it the next day. Like, life doesn't get to be an amusement park every day. In fact, amusement parks aren't even that great. You got to stand in long ass fucking lines in the middle of the summer, dehydrated off your ass because bottles of water are $5. And if you get out of line, you lose your spot. And next thing you know, you're like, I rode three roller coasters. This day was not this magical experience Mickey promised me it would be. Now, when I lived at Six Flags Mountain out there in Santa Clarita, I'd go to an amusement park on a Tuesday. Nobody would be there. I once rode like 13 roller coasters in one day. That was super amazing. But even roller coasters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 wasn't as amazing as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 because uh, after a while, like the whole central nervous system just got used to the roller coaster. It's like it was happening so fast and so frequently that my body and mind didn't even get to appreciate it as much. And that's where I want us to all pause. And that's going to be the topic of our next show, which 217, 217. I did try to line up 47th birthday and 217 um, on the same day. And I did not be able to make that happen, but I will be bringing 217 out. And that's going to be about slowing ourselves down and realizing that sobriety and recovery isn't all about achievement and that there is the recovery The recovery aspect of it is huge. What are we doing to just slow ourselves down and enjoy the ride? The newest newest member of the tribe made a point of saying that today when we met was that, you know, um, you know, I think something to the effect of, you know, if everything, you know, basically, let me see if I can spit this out correctly. I'll paraphrase. You only get 
to enjoy your first three months, six months, one year of sobriety. You only get to enjoy that once. Now, obviously, I think that she even threw in there, you know, some level of, you know, willing of the universe or something, right? But we go into this saying, okay, we're good. We're going to ride or die on this. We're, we're ready to rock and roll. And I love that energy, fantastic energy. And one of the coolest things is, like, she was right. You, you'd only get this first 100 days, 200 days, 300 days. You, you really only get it once, I mean, even if you were to do it multiple times, like that feeling of achieving that for the first time since you were 15, like, that's it. We're in this. Let's enjoy it. And let's have faith in ourselves that, yes, some rocky roads will come up, but the answer isn't at the end of a straw. It's not at the bottom of a bottle. It's not at the tip of the pointy end of a needle, that the answer is inside of ourselves. It's with the hope and the faith and the love that we can create in our lives that can show us that we are fucking worthy. That we are just as worthy as every other human on this planet for the breath that we draw, for the opportunities in front of us to go successfully, for us to be able to laugh with friends, to feel safe when we sleep, to feel stable as we age, and to hopefully have the financial means to not have to work ourselves to our last breath. Like we are worthy of amazing things. And when we can see that in ourselves, when we look in the mirror, that's 99% of the battle. What everybody else might think about us is their own subjective perspective. I can't control it, so I am going to do my best to not even worry about it. Something was said at a recent training I was at. It was like, if you're going to pray, uh, if, if you're, if you're you know, again, paraphrasing here, it's like, if you're going to worry about it, pray about it. But if you're going to pray about it and keep worrying about it, stop bothering God about it. And I thought that was super awesome to hear. It's like, if you're going to worry about it, well, then pray about it. But if you are going to pray about it, and then you continue to worry about it, don't bother God about it. And I, regardless of what um, what higher power you might believe in or not, do whatever you will with the word God in that sentence. I thought it, it, made a, it was very poignant. If you're going to worry about it, then pray about it, right? Journal about it. Work on it. Get it out of your system. Think about what action you can take on it. But if you are going to pray about it, and you're going to continue to worry about it, then stop bothering God about it. It's like, make that decision. Okay, I'm going to think this through. I'm going to pray on it, or I'm going to meditate on it, and then that's it. I'm going to take the actions I need, but I'm also going to release the things that are no longer within my control. If it's not within my control, why am I allowing it to take up so much of my brain energy? These are the things that you can catch yourself doing and say, wow, I am stepping into my recovery. I am fully embracing this new world ahead of me. I specifically told one of the members of the tribe that I was going to create a From Sobriety to Recovery episode, and I'm not really sure I've done a very good job of organizing all of my thoughts. But one of the things I really wanted to do this episode for was just to fling it out there and see what came out. Because there's so many layers to it. Whether you're into God, or you're an atheist, or you're agnostic, or you're into Allah, Buddha, whoever it might be, if you're going to seek their assistance in it, then release the worry. It's another thing that came out at the seminar I was recently. I was like, 90% of my worst experiences in my life never even really happened. And it's amazing how oftentimes we'll, we'll future pace the negative and we'll worry, 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 and we'll build up this anxiety and we'll build up this stress. And then the time comes, it doesn't end up as bad as we thought. It's actually not that bad at all. We're able to figure our way out through it because that's what we do. We figure things out when we're in the middle of them. Future pacing 87 solutions to a problem that doesn't even exist yet is damn near fruitless endeavor. Because even if the problem does show up, the likelihood that it's going to be the way we daydreamed it being is very unlikely. And then all of the resources that are available to us in that moment may not even be ones that we thought of when we were sitting here worrying the shit out of ourselves. That's addiction. The sobriety version of ourselves could at least slow it down and say, no, I no longer need the substance. I no longer need the substance. But is the recovery version the one in charge? That's the one that builds the resources. That's the one that brings in new information. That's the one that tests things, grows and evolves through learning, and then applies and evaluates. 
if you're counting down days and you're not putting in your effort, and whether you're journaling or whether you're exercising or whether you're meditating or whether you're eating healthy, whether you're listening to the podcast, whether you're having deep, vulnerable, meaningful conversations with those you love or pouring your heart out to a therapist, whatever it looks like for you, whatever that sounds like as you're saying it, whatever the feelings you have as you're involved in it, you'll know. You will know that you are embracing your recovery. You will know that you're putting in the effort, that you're putting in the time, that you're working your version of the steps, whatever those may be. I implore all of us to embrace whatever version of sobriety and recovery we are creating in our lives and realize that going backwards, we've read those pages. Play it through to the credits. Know that no matter how much you romanticize what a night of using will be like, in the morning you've got to wake up and you've got to look at that demon inside of you and say, what in the frick did I just do? It's like waking up and being and like looking over and being like, oh my God, I can't believe what happened last night. We're not doing that anymore. We're playing it through to the credits, not to make ourselves feel guilty, not to shame ourselves, but to realize no matter how much we try to romanticize active addiction, in the end, it did not benefit us. What was once our medicine became our poison, and we have an option. And now, for those of you who are long-term in sobriety and recovery, I'll get you out of here on this, realize that there might be some yelling and screaming still happening. There might be some ignoring of certain family members or some non-healing of bridges. There might be still um, some you know, disregard for our physical body and not paying it, it's, it, the attention toward it that it requires in order to be able to continue to manifest the life that we desire for ourselves. There could be some emotional instability or a lack of emotional intelligence within yourself toward other people, automatic negative thoughts and constantly beating ourselves up, right? There could still be the putting in of, of, let's just say, less than kinds of material into our brains. And I'm not saying that you can't watch you know, some silly television shows once in a while. You know, if you're into reality shows or those semi-scripted shows, I'm not telling you to kick all those out and always be watching the Discovery Channel. But let's be mindful of the media we're putting into our brains because that's going to affect our dopamine and our serotonin levels and our endorphins. And then are we monitoring our spirituality, our morals, ethics, values, opinions, beliefs, standards of our habits, and all of the above? Are we monitoring this stuff? Life is happening all around us, all the time. We can try to no longer be aware of it. But once we choose to consciously pay more attention, to have this situational awareness, then again, like I said before about um, you know, self-sabotage, once you realize you're self-sabotaging, it's just a shitty choice. Now we're making better choices, more desirable choices. We're realizing that the recovery is about the healing. It is about the chilling. It is at once in a while. I was just joking about this with one of the tribe members. You know, I used to bust everyone's chops. And, you know, if you're just if you just got sober and all you did was take out the beer, but you still come home from work, sit in your underwear, eating bonbons on the couch while you watch The Simpsons, and you wonder why sobriety sucks, it might be your habits. <laughs> Maybe turn off the damn television and go for a walk. But for those of us that are driven, 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 and we'll cover this more in 217, maybe sitting on the couch in our underwear, eating bonbons, watching the system, watching the system, (laughs) maybe there's a TV show called The System, but definitely meant to say The Simpsons, maybe in that moment, that's exactly what we need to be doing. Maybe part of our recovery is realizing that driving ourselves into the ground and running ourselves red hot all the time is that addictive self, always looking for the next accomplishment, looking for the next high, actually in charge. There are so many layers to sobriety and recovery, I could not have covered them all here. But I'll tell you this much, I can't wait for this year to play itself out, for me to bust my ass at age 47, and for the next 50-some episodes to play out until I turn 48. And then the next 50-some, 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 50-some. I hope, pray, that at 75 years old, I'm at episode like 4,000 or whatever that would be, and we're all still kicking it up, loving our sobriety and recovery. As always, my friends, inclusivity over exclusivity, the power of positive energy, release and flow. Every day is the best day of our lives because we wake up sober. 47 is going to be the best year of my life. Until 48, of course, because I am sober 
and in recovery. Shout out to Sunshine. Wish you were here for this, brother. Glow on, my friends. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.